kid. Seriously. Welcome to a well-rested, well-read, and well-bred version of the Kids Seriously Show. This is the only podcast around where these nerf herders would just as soon kiss a Wookiee. Every so often we get together to discuss news in the realm of Star Wars and other parts of the world that might tickle our fancy. We're going to answer some questions that Kids Seriously got and review an episode from the Clone Wars series. Woe is us this evening. For where there were three, there are now only two. Mark Neitzel, away on holiday, currently battle, battles the Gorgons and Minotaurs on an enchanted isle of Greece. Meanwhile, Luke, fresh from his staycation from exotic locales such as Chicago, sits to my left. Me, I'm Maya Madrid, ready to regress towards the mean. Luke Neitzel, no Mark today, we go it alone. Tell us, how are you? I'm good. I am going to Chicago this weekend. Oh, it's this weekend. See, it's I thought it was last weekend. weekend. You can no. tell how much I, how little I care about your life, apparently. Exactly. I was in the woods of northern Wisconsin last week, so now I'm going. I'm not taking any time off, sadly, but uh, Kevin, noted Kevin Costner enthusiast and friend of the show, Justin and I are going to go see Pearl Jam down at Wrigley. Excellent. So that's our Saturday. Excellent. How are you? Not too bad. Um, I've been watching the show. Have you heard of All or Nothing? No. It's it's essentially Hard Knocks Light, and it's okay. on Amazon, so um, originally I watched like the Los Angeles Rams version, and then I went back and just finished the Arizona Cardinals version, and then started today with this past year's season, which was on the Dallas Cowboys, so it's kind of fun. It's like it's like a you know the reality show and getting behind the scenes and stuff like that. So. Do they have as much access as Hard Knocks? Oh, yeah. Okay. Just yeah. not the production value? or well, Just not the craziness and the oh. zaniness. Like, it, it seems like Hard Knocks tries to set everything up, and whereas the Amazon's like, just this is how it is. It's this not is just to what happened yeah. on this day? Yeah. Nice. I mean, it's, it, it, you know, they're obviously cutting things and, and making sure that it's interesting and stuff like that, but it's not as sensationalized as Hard Knocks. Usually yeah. Hard Knocks searches out that train wreck of a team. Whereas this is usually, you know, the three years, the, the Rams won, I mean, they were bad. It was the first year that they moved there and Jeff Fisher, their coach, ended up getting fired. Like on the show, you saw him give like the goodbye to his oh. players. So, um, that's pretty good. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's just interesting, you know? So I, I, I'll tell you this, Bruce Arians is probably my favorite former coach now. I love that guy. The former coach of the Cardinals, the Cardinals. right? Yeah. He was just awesome. So. Yeah, long time Colts assistant, right? Yep, and um, I think he was with the Steelers. He was with lots of different teams. He's actually went to Virginia Tech. He was the first Virginia Tech player to room with an African American, and it was Tiki and Rondé Barber's dad. Oh wow, yep. that's good for a guy named Arian. <laughs> Not Arian Foster, Bruce Arians. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, so let's uh, let's move on to the news. Luke, multiple news agencies are reporting that the upcoming John Favreau Star Wars television program, which may begin filming already here in October, is going to have a budget of upwards of $100 million or more for the first season, with many, better, with many betting on the more. Potentially, this would put it into the budgetary stratosphere of shows like Game of Thrones and Amazon's upcoming Lord of the Rings show. Other reports have the show focusing on the planet of Mandalore shortly after the return of the Jedi. Luke, a couple different things here. First, is $100 million per season too much of a gamble, or is this just the price of doing business for a franchise that's going to be big budget no matter what? Yeah, I'm nervous whether Disney will be able to survive this if it doesn't hit. I I, I know it's a smart-ass answer, but it's true. Like, you're, you're Disney. that That's a lot of money, but it's not that much money for you to put into this you you put in a you know it's it's you have movies that you make for more than a hundred million dollars that fail and you write them off every year disney has that every studio has that warner brothers has it a lot so <laughs> oh, that's a sick bird. yeah so i i don't think it's that big of a gamble i imagine this is going to be the the cornerstone of their streaming service they're launching so they need it to make a splash right away they need it to be showy it's Star Wars, so it's going to be able to attract people by name, but you want to attract more than just the really die-hard person. You want to draw in that that casual fan. You know, there's a lot of people that watch Game of Thrones that would never classify themselves as fantasy fans. My partner could never make it more than 20 minutes into a Lord of the Rings movie or have any interest in that, but she watches Game of Thrones every, every time it's on. So 
they're trying to make a splash because of the streaming service and i think that's really what it's all about and you know go big i i think that's a great idea yeah, i tend to agree with it but this brings me to my second point luke with as much money is john favreau the guy i know we've talked about this before it, it kind of worries me about running a show yeah he's had some hits at the movies he's also had some clunkers is he the dude to pull this off? Like, I, I just, I'm a little concerned. I don't have a massive opinion of him as a creator. Like you said, he's got some things I like and some things I really don't like. So I, I think it's a gamble, but there aren't really sure things that are gonna, gonna work. And they've kind of, they've gone both ways recently, right? Like, they've taken really established people and they've taken really rookie people and you just never know how things are going to turn out. But they've obviously had a good relationship for him and what he did with Marvel and what he did with the Jungle Book that have been big successes. So Disney like him. He really likes Star Wars. I mean, he's in Solo. So it's a natural fit there. So I, th I think they're comfortable, and that's what's most important. And I guess it falls into that zone, very similar to, for me, Ron Howard and Solo, where it may not work out, but I don't think it'll be just flat-out terrible, mm -hmm. like some risks could be so i i'm not in majorly enthused by it but i'm not i'm not super worried about it either um but then again you also look at you know everyone thought dc being able to bring josh whedon over was a major coup and look how that turned out he did half a movie and was out the door did so you, did you notice just as a quick aside did you notice at the beginning of uh of the justice league movie where they had the uh, the homeless person holding the sign that said i tried Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, that, I, yeah. A quick aside, like, but I, I think you're right. You know, like, like times where you think that there's a home run, there, there hasn't necessarily been, and times where maybe we've we've been surprised a lot in in these sort of nerd movies about people who, um, you know, I mean, Days of Future Past is a movie we both really liked coming out of the theater at least, and we thought that was going to be a for sure bomb with with Brian Singer's. Uh, track record and we both loved that movie and thinking that was one of the best x-men movies and so there's there's room for people to surprise us i just dude i'm nervous i'm nervous like thinking about a hundred million dollar budget for the season um and we'll get into the setting in a bit here but the setting sounds like it's going to be more uh more compact than i was hoping I, and plus the setting like right after return of the jedi like I, there's there's a lot here that makes me nervous. So what makes you nervous about the setting? I, I, that's where we were going next. So I'm yeah. assuming. So. so so the setting of Mandalore, I just I feel like it's people love Boba Fett, and they love him because of what he looks, and not because of what he does. Right? They just like the, the look of him. And and I haven't watched Rebels, but apparently Mandalore is a huge part of Rebels. And... Well, one of the one of the team is from Mandalore okay. in Rebels, and she's very very popular. Okay. So I just feel like it's. It's making, you know, John Campion talks a lot about wanting the desire of, his desire to, like, expand the universe rather than constrict it. And when we get to the episode that we watched today, I have the same problem where it's just, like, it's going back to Geonosis. It's going back to Mandalore or something that we've kind of seen or have, like, a history with. Like, I want new, which I know, given my, my opinions on The Last Jedi, are different, but I think... I think I want completely new. I don't want you to mess with stuff or time periods that I really like, and I want you to go back to things that I've already seen. And I think, you know, while I liked Solo and didn't like The Last Jedi, I don't like it when they mess with the characters that I like, and I'm, I'm worried it's going to start... They're going to not be able to resist the temptation of going back. I don't want any more stories about Leia, Han, or Luke. I well, I think those things will be hard because you can't recast them. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe at some point you will be, but I think it's too soon for them to try and recast and put versions of them in this show. This is why I think Mandalore works okay. for me. Is Good. Put my heart at rest. Okay. I, I need this today. Because what, what you're looking at doing is what I kind of talked about earlier. Like You don't want this just to be a show that's about hardcore, I check message boards, everyday fan. Mm -hmm. So the thing about doing something in Mandalore is you're you're presumably not having Boba Fett. I really hope not having Boba Fett in it, just letting him be dead. Yeah, but you might end up having like a hundred Boba Fetts in that armor. And, but that's what I'm getting to is that 
that armor is recognizable. Mm -hmm. That armor screams Star Wars. People will see that armor that are casual fans. They will know exactly what that is and, and be able to identify with it. Now, within what we've seen of Mandalore culture, it's kind of a tribal society and there's different armors that mean different things. So there is a whole world that really hasn't been deep dived into because we've seen two Mandalorians in the actual movies and they're, you know, Django and Boba who are a clone of each other. You know, or, you know Django is the only real Mandalorian we've actually seen. And none of those characters are in the movies for very long. So there's a lot you can do within that world that can be new storylines, new look at characters, new things in the universe, but you're still giving us kind of that familiar setting that's going to draw in more than the hardcore. And I think that's important, especially when you're talking about launching an entire platform. Because if this is a hit, then you can spin off of that. Or you can go to somewhere else within the universe and expand upon it. But they need to set a solid foundation before they go too far away from what people know. I think those are all really good points. Now, here's my fear. A scene with 100 people in Boba Fett armor. Well, you know that's happening because they're all they're all going to be wearing it. Um, but at least it's not... What I di didn't want from these shows is to have them try to, you know, fill the gaps in of what the major characters were doing but having to avoid the major characters like you could have a wedge show or whatever and then you know he's always talking to Luke where's the through... guys in yeah. the bathroom well yeah there's a communicator I'll talk to him <laughs> on the communicator like I don't want that type of thing right. like that's what really really worried me so I think this is good because it gives us the familiar but it gives them a completely different setting that they can do whatever story they want and it's not going to affect anything we've seen in the movies or will see in future movies I hope you're right or it'll I be really awful. Hope. One of the I two. Really hope, I really hope you're right. Hey, Luke. Hey, what? It's time for Finland and Timu Solani's favorite game show. It's Am I Right or Am I Wrong? Because Mark is gone, we cannot bring you the full-fledged, full Monty Firestorm. So we have adapted the rules for single match play. This week, in order to take a break from the heavy burden of the belt, Luke Neitzel has requested to ask me the questions. He will ask me seven questions. And in good American style, immediately tell me if I am right or wrong. If I get four correct, I win. If I don't, well, I'm somewhat used to losing this game already. Luke Neitzel, are you ready to take the reins? I am, and you should think of this more as a sparring match to get yourself loose and ready for, you know, maybe we'll have number one contender matches in the future and stuff like that. So you, like you're, that. you're just trying to get into fighting shape. I know, it's, a, it's been difficult so far for me. I, I, I The Stacy X thing still bothers still, me. Still burns you deep. Well, I uh, picked Heath Ledger for a performance of a movie that he wasn't even eligible for in a question. So we've Did all, you get the point for it? We've been there. No, I okay. lost badly. Yeah. I still won that round, obviously, okay. but... That question I did not. Okay, get good. Correct. I'm glad I, I should I not have. Feel that I did the right thing there. There was justice. So let me ask you: Are you ready? Oh, I no, but All right. we can't just have dead air here. Well, we can, but <laughs> it'll turn off our two listeners. <laughs> Thanks, Joy. Um, so we're gonna start out in one of my favorite areas, which is oversized giant sharks. Okay. Because. The Meg, the Meg, the, the Meg, Meg. It, the Meg, it chomped up the competition this weekend at the box office with a pretty impressive debut. It had 45 million domestically and 147 million oh, internationally, yeah. which is pretty impressive. The internationals love the, the Meg. Though I was a little surprised. I looked at Box Office Mojo and I think it cost like 130, 40 million, which kind of surprised me. They spent that much on it, but good for them. They're going to make it back. And, you know, who doesn't want to see a... a tyrannosaurus sized shark chase after a rat terrier like I, I enjoy that i might actually go see it tomorrow to be honest but my question then is what movie has the greatest monster or monsters in it oh well, that's easy dracula hands down dracula is probably the one of the best horror movies i've ever seen and it's classic and it's iconic and it's dracula that's the answer and which which version are you picking the original Okay. The, well, the one that you recommended. Okay. For me. The, the Universal Bella Lugosi. Yes. Okay. Yes. Bella okay. Lugosi is the greatest so, monster actor of all time. So, so technically it is incorrect, but it's your first one and it is a very good answer. So I'm still going to give you the Thank point. Thank you. Thank you. You are um, fair and just. The correct answer is the Xenomorphin Alien. 
That is that the also actual, really good. And the I actual really, correct answer. I will, I will tell you that that might be my second favorite horror movie. Oh, really? I, see, I, I love that Alien movie. Is that un- is unbelievable. And I have a... Because I love that movie so much, I have a massive blind spot to the numerous faults in every other movie that features a Xenomorph. <laughs> that are, I realize how absolutely terrible they are, but I still love them. Now, at the risk of getting my point taken away, can I tell you I have not seen Aliens yet? Which means... It's more of an action movie, I understand, but I just, I you know, I saw Alien, which was a huge thing for me, and that was within the last year. Okay. So, uh, a- Aliens is actually close to my least favorite. Really? Okay. Them. Yeah, it's got some good lines and some good scenes, but it's such a 80s action movie, which yeah. isn't my genre at all, that it's disappointing to me. I don't think it holds up as well as people remember when they, they were 12 yeah. and saw it. So we're, we're going to... the truth about lots of different movies. Lots of things, yeah. So we're going to stick with the Meg. Because, yeah. you know, any movie that's about... This is hard. It's not in my wheelhouse. This is. And and we're going to veer a little bit, though, because okay. the first thing is whenever you have a movie about giant sharks, you're yeah. now stuck to have it automatically compared to the pinnacle of right. that type of movie, sharks. which is 1999's Deep Blue Sea. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Because Fair enough. Everyone loves a movie about, uh, you know, sharks that get Alzheimer's medicine, become super smart... And you get to watch them rip apart the living version of a angry Twitter egg and Michael Rappaport. I kind of, I kind of want to see that movie now. It's totally worth it, and legitimately has one of the best character death scenes. Spoiler: When Samuel L. Jackson gets it, it's absolutely amazing. Now, other than Samuel L. Jackson and his memorable death, what really should propel this movie into every single AFI Top 100 list? is that it has the most iconic theme song of all time, LL Cool J's Deepest Bluest, which features a chorus that has this lyrical poetry. It's one line that he repeats over and over for the chorus, and it goes, Deepest Bluest, my hat is like a shark's fin. Deepest Bluest, my hat is like a shark's fin. <laughs> so obviously this is the peak of human creation. Like, right. we're not going to talk... We're never going to be able to talk that. So we got to go the other way. What's the worst song that was specifically created for a movie? Princes in Batman, and I can't remember the exact name, but when he is talking about the Joker and the Joker at the end of the movie when he's doing the celebration and the dancing and uh, um, that sort of thing, you know, money, 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 who do you trust? Come on, who do you trust? Like, I hate that part of the movie. I'll say that. That's I'm, what popped in my head. I'm sorry, that is incorrect. Okay. Um, and actually, this is, this is really hard. I really thought you were going to get a point on this one because what I actually have written down is any reasonable answer will be accepted. Oh, but, but I went Prince, you will get a, Minnesota. You yeah. will get a minus point if you mention Kiss from a Rose or Wild Wild West. <laughs> That's what I actually wrote down. But yeah, I'm from Minnesota and you yeah. just insulted Prince. So the only song that uh, you're allowed to insult by Prince is that horrible Vikings theme song that you know what he I, deleted. You know what I should have answered is anything from Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. I went back and, and watched, uh, tried to watch that movie, and you you asked me at one time, because I love Robin Hood, you're like, I wonder if that's watchable, and the answer is no. <laughs> but Alan Rickman's still good, I bet. I never got to Alan oh, Rickman, okay. I turned it off. Yeah, yeah, I imagine that does not hold up, but Brian Adams, man, what an artist. So we're going to switch gears here, so you're one for one, you're, oh, you're one and one. All right, so, yep. You know, it's not bad. need to get on a run, I need to get bad. on a run. But we're switching gears. Okay. Totally new topic. Okay. So former ECW founder and current WWE creative lead and Brock Lesnar's manager, Paul Heyman. Yes. He was on the latest episode of Monday Night Raw. Okay. And I didn't see it, but apparently he gave a speech that was so good that media critics were writing that it deserved Emmy consideration. Wow. And noted sports media columnist Richard Deitch tweeted, and this is word for word, Heyman is as good as Daniel Day-Lewis tonight. So despite intermittent waves of popularity and big crossover stars like The Rock that came from wrestling, it's basically looked at as the bastard stepchild of sports, entertainment, all of that. Should Emmy voters look at wrestling more seriously? And if they do, what category does a wrestling performer fit into? Well, the first thing I want to say is that for as good as The Rock is, and for as good as some people like Kurt Angle and Triple H from back when we used to watch wrestling, the best thing that I've ever seen was CM Punk's shoot when he was about to leave uh, the the WWE. And that actually got me in back into wrestling for a couple months there. And a big part of that was Paul Heyman. And so I think that that's absolutely fantastic. But the answer is no. Um, there are all sorts of... There, there are countless upon countless upon countless of these award shows 
that mean nothing. And, I mean, there's not a category where it fits perfectly. Um, if, if they did, I, I think they'd have to create a new category. Um, but no, I mean, there's the, those shows are too damn long anyways, and I don't watch them anyways. I'm not going to watch for one more thing. Well, what I have written down is, whatever, awards for art are kind of dumb. <laughs> So points All right. for you. That was well done. I also said you'd get a point if you mentioned the passing of Jim the Anvil Nyhard this weekend. Oh my so. goodness! What I, my my dream was always to go on um, on uh, Collider Schmodown with you mm-hmm. and have you be the hitman and for me oh, to be the that, anvil. That would be amazing. And would be, I had the glasses like, when I was like I, eleven. I'd have to grow the beard, but I mean, I, I don't think they're calling anytime soon. So probably not. Yeah. Shocked. Shocked. Well, I'm considering. Sure they listen to this. Considering I rip on John Roca a lot on the uh, on the old Twitter. Well, he has such a thick skin. I'm sure he handles that well. <laughs> so you are winning right now. You this, are no, two, don't don't do that. To two, me. Okay, don't it's do that two to, to me. it's two one. Yeah, it's just what it is. Or we two, don't worry about the score. Points. Okay, we just gotta do our job. All right. Okay, question to question, we're just gonna do our job. So Orange is the New Black yes. and Triple X Three Star Ruby Rose yes. was cast as so Batwoman. So good. So perfect casting. And that's an, an upcoming DC TV series. Yes. So this is obviously a major step because Batwoman is an openly LGBTQ, she's a lesbian yes. character, and we don't get a ton of characters like that. And despite the fact that people on Twitter are stupid and right. forced Ruby Rose to quit t- Twitter because they were mad that uh, a non-LGBTQ actor... Who is LGBTQ. Yeah, yeah, was playing Batwoman. They right. didn't realize she actually is old, right. has been out for a very long time. So it's awesome that a... That a a lesbian woman is playing a lesbian character on TV. But we still see a lot of underrepresentation, especially in the giant movie franchises. So we've had campaigns on the internet to get Bucky and Cap, uh, and Cap or Foe and Pin together. Foe Fo and, and Pin. <laughs> Finn and Poe together yeah. as couples. Um, and even J.K. Rawlings has stated that Dumbledore is gay. He's gay. Yeah. But we haven't seen any mentions of that on screen in the we Harry will. Potter film or Fantastic Beasts yep. and Where to Find Them. And the latest rumblings are that they will not discuss Dumbledore's sexuality in the new movie that's Dumbledore heavy, The Fantastic really? Beasts and the Surprising. Crimes of Grindelwald, which okay. is a major disappointment. Yeah. So, my question is here, what will be the first major franchise that has a features a major character that is LGBTQ? Well, um as a fantastic question, I think okay, so first we got to say what is a major franchise? I honestly think it's going to be Marvel. Yeah? I think Marvel will. Um, Trying to think of who it would be. Um, I think Miss America, Miss America Chavez, is is gay and is lesbian, and I think that's what it will be. I think I think this is going to be really successful because just like you said that that it's not often that this kind of happens, especially by Warner Brothers and DC. It is a very uncommon actress. Like Ruby Rose. Okay, first of all, let's talk about that. Batwoman is like an awesome, awesome character, and this is played by an awesome, just like you need somebody to like a gravitas of like Batwoman. You know what I mean? Like it, like that person's got to bring it. And Ruby Rose's look, like she just is perfect. Okay. And so, um, I think this is going to be extremely successful and Marvel is going to jump at the opportunity and, uh, and we'll, we'll push Miss America into it. Could be, but you're wrong. Okay. The answer is going to be Star Wars and it is going to be in the Ryan Johnson trilogy. I bet that character is already on the page and in development now because he's going to have the ability to do more of what he wants and create his whole brand new characters where Marvel has to find someone who already is in canon and then work them in and work them in. And, and, you know, we get, you get into the debate a little bit of is Miss America a major character? Shit, dude! None of those ca- those characters were major characters when they first. Came. More so than her, though. That's true. So you know, it's it. I I think Ryan Johnson's trilogy. We're gonna see it. I I agree with you that I I don't That's think a fair point. But Rocket Raccoon. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and apparently Lando could be into robots. So I don't know <laughs> what what letter that gets. Um, but yeah, it, the answer is Star Wars. Ryan Johnson. Yeah. So I was actually gonna. I was thinking about Episode Nine. I thought maybe. JJ would put it I would have given I would have given you the point for if you would have well, said Star you know, Wars, even though I wrote Ryan Johnson. Would have could have would have could have should have. Yep. So that moves us on to question five, and this is a barn burner. So the Guardians of the Galaxy director. It's two to two, right? Two to two. Okay. Rumor chair or two two points total, I guess, since yeah. you're not playing anyone. Uh, the the Guardians of the Galaxy director's chair continues its tilt a world run. 
every time you turn on your computer, they either are going to pick James Gunn back or they're not. The yeah. latest today is that they're not. And quite honestly, I'm kind of tired of paying attention to it. But I'll tell you who's not tired of paying attention to it. And it better be those dumbasses over at the Worlds of DC. Because, yes, that is the name of the new DC Cinematic Universe. Oh, okay. They finally gave it a name. I like how there's multiple worlds. So they're just giving themselves that wiggle room to reboot. <laughs> exactly. And to think it took them like eight years to come up with that name. Right. But anyways, they're the ones who should be paying close attention. Because if he is available, they need to swoop in on that as soon as possible and lock it down. So if we assume he is not coming back, James Gunn is not coming back to Marvel, and they bring him over to Worlds of DC, what property should he work on? Depends on what they'd want to do with this character. Uh, my, my favorite character is The Flash, and I think he would be absolutely perfect as a Wally West sort of jokester Flash, similar to that we saw in um, the Justice League cartoon in around the turn of the century. So I would go there, uh, but the answer, honestly, is whatever the fuck he wants. I'm, I'm going to give you a point on that, because I like all your answers. What I, I wrote down two things down. I wrote Martian Manhunter, yeah. just because I was that's that kind of a crazy a crazy character that he could do something with. And I also wrote down Superman. Yeah, that'd be great. Because that would be someone to take the realm and maybe put him more in the kind of the version of Superman that I think a lot of casual people have in their head, as far as being hopeful and cheerier, mm -hmm. as opposed to like dour and... and you know, mournful the entire time, but I and you kind of hit that vein with Flash anyway. And you're right, whatever he wants to do, just right. let him Pay let him do man. it. It'll be fine. So we have two questions left. I you need, need to get one, one point this is, out of okay, here. Okay, there has been situations in my life as a Cubs fan. I have been here. Just want to say. Yeah, well, we all have. So and then the Cubs finally won the World Series, and a couple weeks later, Donald Trump was elected. Yeah, so well, I was like, okay, I'm gonna ebbs and flows, it. ebbs right. and flows. Let's hit the world of footy since you brought it into sports. All right. So as much as we pine for our beloved Chicago Fire, yes. anyone who really knows you knows that that is really second in your heart. Your heart's a little farther east out there in Spain. You share, I am Madrid. You share a team love like many of your cultural heroes, such as Rafa Nadal, Viggo Mortensen, <laughs> Enrique Iglesias, and General <laughs> Francisco Frank. It's been an unusual summer of exits oh, yeah. over at yep. the reigning uh, European champion. So you, historic manager Zinedine Zidane has quit his post. Zizou, I love you. Cristiano um, Ronaldo's already been scoring for Juventus, even though they haven't really started their season. And then among the other departures, we're now getting word that World Cup Mighty Mouse extraordinaire Luka Modric would rather be in Italy and has made clear his intentions to move to Inter Milan. So far, you've only brought in a goalkeeper, who's a very, very good goalkeeper, yeah. but I don't really think Keeler Navas was the problem. I, I would disagree with that. Okay. You, and you would watch closer than me. So, And it's only going to get harder. The English window closed earlier. Now, you can still take players out of there, but those teams can't get replacements, so they're a lot less likely to sell. Right. So it's getting harder and harder to find quality reinforcements. So this is a two-part question. The first question, and you, you have to wait to answer them both. Sure. The first question is, how you doing, buddy? How you doing? And the second question is, if Madrid's not able to add a superstar or two in this window, what's a reasonable expectation for success in this coming season? So, how am I doing is really the the, 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 the thing that really hurt was, was Zizou. I kind of have been preparing myself for the last three seasons that Cristiano was going to go. Now, Cristiano is one of my favorite sports icons of, of all time, of my entire life. It's, you know, the, the Mount Rushmore is uh, Aaron Rodgers, Cristiano Ronaldo, and Don Mikowski. Those That's kind of my, my group. And so to lose him, I've been preparing myself for years now. Zizou, it hurts because so many people doubted him when he first got the job. And for him to do what he did and win, you know, three Champions League titles and continue the four and five years. Um, I, I just love the fact that, that he shut all the naysayers up. Just like he did, I mean, I read a lot. I, I wasn't paying attention to soccer at the time. But there were a lot of people who second-guessed him and thought he couldn't play, and he did that as a player, and now he's done it as a manager. And so while I'm, you know, kind of like he, he wanted to go, he was just done, he's at the end of his rope, that's totally cool, but that one really hurt bad because I wasn't really expecting it. Um, so how am I doing? I am okay. Uh, the, the, the new manager who was taken from Spain right before the World Cup, I thought didn't look, it wasn't a good look for the team. And while I, I'm really happy about Courtois 
Like, I, I, I think he's a really good player. But what I want to get out of this season, to be honest, is let's see if Isco and Asensio can, can do the deed. Let's see if they are the guys that you can build a team around. Because here's the honest truth, Luke. Madrid, for the entirety that Cristiano Ronaldo was there, would just disappear and say, Cristiano, do your thing. And now you have these two young players who've get, kind of been pushed to the side that everybody who looks at them thinks that they have superstar potential. It's put up or shut up time. And so I definitely don't want to lose Modric. I think that hurts. But at the same time, we have to find out what we have in Isco and Asensio. And, you know, wherever that leads us, we have to know the answer to that question. And it's, it's harder and harder for Madrid to spend like they used to. They can't blow teams out of the water because England makes so much money. So you're going to have to get good at cultivating youth. And this is when we have to, to figure it out. I would love to get rid of Benzema. That was the other thing. I hate Benzema. Um, so what do I think is a fair expectation of where they will finish? Second. I think if Asensio is great and Isco is great, they'll finish second. If they're not, they'll finish third or fourth. So if they finish second, you would say that's a success for the this year? It depends. I mean, if, if Asensio and Isco look like guys you can build... I don't want qualifiers. Team. I want to know what what trophies and table position qualify as a success. And Madrid only, only first. Okay, so what we have written here is this is an Everton where avoiding relegation is a win and European <laughs> League is a bonus. This is not Arsenal and the never-ending pursuit of the fourth-place trophy. This is Real Madrid. You expect a double, so I'm going to give you a point there, sir. Okay. You were you're really getting away from me there, but you brought it back at the end. Well, that's uh, so, that's the expectation is always to win. I like it. All right, so we have one last question. I already and you already um, have four points. I, so this is uh, take the this pressure off. Spark, this yeah. Is, yeah, this I'm just going to let it rip here. Yeah, this is this is just bad I hope practice. I don't. I hope I don't offend Prince again. <laughs> I would try not to. Okay. That would be my advice heading into this one. So. I just don't want it to hurt further, yeah. further competitions. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We'll have an all-Prince themes one. So, question seven. Yeah. Last Saturday, the 2017 version of the Agatha Christie world-famous novel Murder on the Orient Express debuted on HBO. And this movie ba- boasts a very impressive cast. You have Kenneth Branagh. And some parts that may be not so well, impressive. Who's imp- your boy, Johnny Depp? Na- well, name-wise. Yeah, know. It's a, you know, Kenneth Branagh, Daisy Ridley, Lamar Odom Jr., Dame Judi Dench, Michelle Pfeiffer, Penelope Cruz, Josh Gad, Johnny <laughs> Depp, and noted city of Appleton, Wisconsin hater, Willem Dafoe. He hates Appleton, Wisconsin. He is know. from there, and he hates it. He calls really? it hell on earth. Okay. Yep. So, we all know that giant shared movie universes like the Avengers have impressive casts. So what's a non-massive franchise movie that has the most impressive list of names in their cast? Well, that's a great question. I thought you were going to say what's the best mur- or murder mystery that you've seen, and I was going to go with, I guess, the Christie's, and then there were none. And that would have been my hope of you know, a big name um, movie. But that, that's not what it did. And I'm obviously no, stalling not it. here for uh, time because I can't think and this is hard because there is no points for trying on this one this is a definitive there's one answer well and see the thing is i would have said oceans 11 before it became a franchise because i thought that that first movie was just phenomenal Shh, there's a single bead of sweat <laughs> starting on goonies the goonies all right i'm sorry that is incorrect oh, okay. that is a that is a decent cast but the the answer is the 1991 oliver stone movie jfk which I've, I've never I've, seen it. So I, I wrote down a list of names here that mm-hmm. I pulled just off the IMDb. Uh, so it starts Kevin Costner, obviously. Your favorite. Show favorite. Right. Sissy Spacek, Gary Oldman, Joe Pesci, Lolita Davidovich, Tommy Lee Jones, Kevin Bacon, Frank Whaley, Ed Asner, Jack Lemmon, Walter Matthau, Don Sutherland, Sally Kirkland, John Larry Kent, Vincent D'Onofrio, Lori Metcalf, Brian Doyle Murray, Wayne Knight, Martin Sheen, Michael Rooker, and John Candy. That is an impressive list. I'm not sure I agree that that's a better cast than Goonies. Oh, the sure, the sure quantity. It's not a better movie than Goonies, but <laughs> impressive cast. I've never seen the movie. I've never had a chance. So I'm you, gonna take you my get that grade. one wrong, but you yeah. still get the four points. I'm and happy camper. Out of seven, that'll do it. So congratulations. Thank you. I feel great. I feel great. One step ahead of Mark. There you go. All right, so it's about that time to break forth the rhythm and the rhyme. We are heading to questions that kids seriously got. Boom, age seven, writes, Uncle Luke, did you see any movies while you were on vacation? I did see movies. We didn't go to a movie, 
because uh, we, we didn't have a rainy day. But the place we were staying up in the North Woods had, it was a house that we rented, and they had like 200 DVDs, two, 300 DVDs that we went through. But I was there with my in-laws and my sister-in-law, and uh, so we had to find a movie. I didn't, yeah, I didn't pick any of, of the movies. A lot of tripwire over there. <laughs> yeah, so you gotta go. So we watched two movies out there. One we watched was Invictus which is a Clint Eastwood movie about South Africa winning the World Cup of Rugby and about the, the nation coming together um, after apartheid, which I'll let you explain to Boom yeah. what that's all about. But She has some ideas. She knows yeah. a lot about that sort of thing. So. Yeah, well, you know, Milwaukee can be a good example of it yeah. sometimes. So that movie, it, it was good. Um, it had some, some failings. It's not a perfect movie. It's a, definitely the performances. Morgan Freeman as Nelson Mandela and yeah. Matt Damon as the captain of the rugby team are very good, though his accent's a little uh, on it. Um, it has some kind of subplots that I think distract from what what is a more cohesive story. But it is, it's definitely worth seeing, and I would recommend. And then the other movie we watched was Six Days and Seven Nights, which is a uh, romantic jungle comedy starring Harrison Ford, Anne Heche, and David Schwimmer. That was not quite as good. <laughs> Was it, wasn't there a thing with Harrison Ford and Anne Heche? Were they... No, he's Calista Flockhart, Allie McBeal. He's still oh, married okay. to her. So, so where she, Anne, Anne Heche, Heche was she was... with Ellen DeGeneres. That's right. Ellen DeGeneres is one of my favorite people on the planet. Yeah, well, I think she did well getting out of that relationship because I know Anne Heche had some, some weird, uh, I think, drug-related problems mm-hmm. and breakdowns and whatnot. But, uh, so, boom, if you're, you know, you're listening to this, don't watch Six Days, Seven Nights. Watch Invictus instead. I don't think she's allowed to watch either. But we'll, probably we'll probably for the best. <laughs> All right, we're to that point in time where we talk about the Clone Wars episode. We got season two, episode five, landing at Point Rain. Believe in yourself, or no one else will. Written by Brian Larson and directed by another Brian Keelan O'Connell. This episode gives us a first-hand account of the Battle Royale 2 at Geonosis, that planet from the Attack of the Clones. Luke, take it away. So, I have very few bullet points because there isn't a lot of plot There in this really one. isn't. We get the opening crawl which or narration which tells us that this is a completely different story that is unrelated As Maya mentioned, we're going back to Geonosis. The leader of the Geonosians, who I didn't realize in the movies is called Poggle the Lesser. Uh, So I don't know if there's Poggle the... Is that the best name? It is the best name. But is there a Poggle the the Mightier or Poggle the the Better? Yeah. Uh, He has built a droid factory, a massive droid factory on Geonosis that they're cranking out droids and they've, they've ray shielded it so you can't just bomb it from the surface. So what the... Jedi are going to do is basically launch a massive strike on Geonosis to destroy this facility. And we have three, well, four Jedi technically, but three Jedi generals that are here. So we have Obi-Wan, we have Anakin, who's got Ahsoka with him, and then we have Kiati, who is someone that is very prominent as far as Jedis are that we didn't know in the prequels going into it. He has the large penis-shaped head, for a better description of it. Uh, he is there. It's his first real appearance in the show, which is kind of surprising for how quick they like to pull things that we're familiar with out. They took a while to get to him. So they are all going to be on different carrier ships, land on the planet with their attacking armies, and meet in one single landing zone where they can coordinate their attack. So the beginning of the episode is them kind of on their cruiser prepping for war. There's a, a nice little moment that I actually liked between Cody and... Uh, Obi-Wan where Cody asked him about the original Battle of Geonosis because he wasn't there and Anakin reference or uh, Obi-Wan references being tied to a pole and and all those things and there's kind of some nervous chuckles as the ships go it's down. Great, it's a great joke there too because he says he says something along the lines of wow that must have been pretty entertaining and Obi-Wan's like yeah for the Ge- Geonosians. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I I didn't mind I didn't mind that opening and then this is just a flat-out war episode. Yeah. This is one battle. There is no plot, really, to this. But what ends up happening is all three of the Jedi generals end up crashing in different parts of the planet. Now, before we get too far, there's a problem that I have with this episode, and it's during the planning phase. 
when everybody is joking about how war kills and, and they're, they're counting the kills and that sort of thing. And it's just, it's more of the same of hopping around the idea of like, sometimes this is a very intense show and sometimes it isn't. And it really is a lighthearted approach. And, and as we talk about this later, cause it'll come up later. I think they really missed a golden opportunity to really hit something home. Um, they could have hit a home run. It was like a fastball right down the middle. And I, strike through I think we're on the exact same page, and we should probably talk about it at the end of the yeah, episode. I agree. But yeah, I was in the same boat where I thought they were. I thought they were going to do something at the very last thirty seconds that would have really tied everything home, and they completely whiffed on it, yeah. which is disappointing. So we'll get there. But yeah, there is kind of the Jedi joking around, especially Anakin and Ahsoka. And what we learned from them throughout this whole episode is they, at every battle they're in, not just this one, they keep a running total of how many droids they can kill, and Anakin always wins, is the, the gist of it. So they all crash separately, the three Jedi generals, and... Are they going to survive? Are they going to survive? So Anakin and Ahsoka crash, and they basically are, they're not wounded, and they have some of their troops, but they're far away from this landing zone. So they have to make their way there, and they basically have to go through. It's a wall that the droids have built, and they have to try to take their squadron through that wall. So they battle through that. Now, uh, Kiati has also landed somewhere else far from the landing zone, so he's got to take his battalion through. And he is wounded, but he's still able to kind of walk and fight. And they have to go through a cave to get to the landing zone. And then you have... Obi-Wan, who basically crashed in the landing zone, and he has some tanks and some troops, but Obi-Wan is really injured, can barely stand, and they basically are in the position of, we just have to survive until more people can get here. So they form a little circle with their tanks, and they're just trying to stay alive. Anakin and Ahsoka fight through this wall. It ends up being kind of a droid processing wall or something like droids pop out of the top of it and they have a, a decent fight up there with them they also have a fight with the destroyer droids and one of the things i was just dying i was like please do this please do this please do this they shoot their grappling hooks up on top just like the old batman and robin tv show from 1966 huh. and i wanted that scene where they turn the camera to the side and oh. they have them like climbing up if they had done this, that would have vaulted this to my favorite episode of all time. Like, I was just ready for it. And just like what we talk about at the end here, it just didn't come through for me. It just didn't hit. They do have some good moments, though, in this battle. Uh, one thing I really liked is they have the destroyer droids, which are the rolling ones with the blast shields. And what they, they do in those is, is you can't shoot them and you can't lightsaber through the blast shield, but you can just put organic matter, apparently, through the blast shields. So one of them has him cornered, and Cody is up there, or it must have been Rex is up there with him, and Rex just sticks his hand point blank through the through that the shield and then blows its head off, and then uh, Anakin or Ahsoka does the same thing with the other one. And this was also one of the times I thought we finally used the Force in a proper way because that wall is about to explode, and the Jedi have to get off there. So what they do is they push Rex off, and then they jump off, and they use the Force to catch Rex, and they to lower themselves down. Which... See, I didn't like this because it was uneven for me. Like, if you are that powerful in the Force, then you could use it to go up, ideally. Yeah. And, and they're just... The but that's a flaw throughout all of Star Wars, right? Yeah, I, know. I mean, there's there's so many things they should be able to do so much easier than they can. I mean, they should all be able to fly. Yeah. Hey, I just liked it when Luke Skywalker could do, like, little things. Yeah. You know, I like... Call me a, a Marvel homer, but I like my guys and my gals a little underpowered. Yeah, yeah, I disagree on this, though, because we're trying to make Anakin... Anakin's going to become the worst villain in the whole thing, so he needs to be overpowered or building towards overpowered. And I guess for me, if you're going to set the rules one way in the universe, then then have them be smart enough to use the mm. rules. Like, if you wanted to say something... You know, throw something in there about how midi chlorians can't manipulate other midi chlorians, so that's the reason they can't... They can't make themselves fly. I mean, there's there's things you could do, but they set the the universe rules for how the Force works... As basically, it can do anything, and then they use it for very little things. So it's just something you have to accept. Hey, you know what I liked? Desert troopers. Yeah, they look the good. Troopers. I don't know what happened. I think I, I like to think that like times got tough when the emperor took over, and like the money was real limited, so they didn't have the money for like the desert trooper clones, you know, yeah. star troopers. So they just ah, I'll just send the white ones out there <laughs> to Tatooine. But <laughs> yeah, no, it was a good look. Uh, with the red dust and everything flying around. But I didn't... I, I thought that brown palette, kind of like, it just, everything looked washed out. I thought the visuals in this were really, really strong, but it was hurt by the colors because they were so... You know, the colors of the ground are the same colors as the wall is the same color as the mountain. It just blended together kind of wrong to me. 
and in but but you look at like the textures and how well it was done and the care that it was given was really good but i thought it was a bad palette choice see i think it's i think it was really good and i think if you watch this episode the immediate comparisons you can draw in multiple different ways but especially in the look and how it's you know filmed or shot and the sound is that someone watched saving private ryan the opening sequence mm-hmm. of saving private ryan right before this episode and it's kind of that kind of washed out the same as they are. They have to use the red because Geonosis is a red sand planet. But like if you watch the opening of Private Ryan, you know, the beaches are very washed out. Their uniforms match it. The, the walls of the fortresses match it that they're trying to invade because that's what you would do in war. Like your camouflage should blend in with everything else. And it is kind of a mess. And I think that was their inspiration. So on that level, it, it worked for me mm. personally. I. Uh, Kiati goes through this tunnel, and that's almost horror movie like because it's got the Geonosians, who are kind of these flying monsters, that and they're just cool. flying through and grabbing people and taking them off to their death and having to to fight them off. So that was a pretty a pretty good sequence. Um, and as he makes his way to the landing zone, and Obi Wan's just trying to stay alive basically, but we do get to see the uh, return of Waxer and um, his buddy, who I forgot to write the name down. Of. Boyle. Boyle. That's right. Waxer and Boyle were there, so that was kind of nice to see that they're still alive no we care nobody else might yeah we care meanwhile up in space admiral yularen is still a huge dick but he yeah. kind of tries to help is he evil like is there i don't know if that's coming i, I haven't looked ahead you know those spoilers but like i feel like he's been a dick i mean i guess that's the best way that you put it yeah but i feel like he's like well, gonna turn Oh, I'm sure. I mean, sure, he fits well into what the Imperials wants out of there. He just looks like Imperial, right? Yeah, well, yeah, he does look. He does look like that. So he'll he'll fit in well. But he's not trying to obstruct them. He's kind of like, well, I have my duty and my things that I'm doing, and I'm not going to divert anything to help you guys. I kind of will, but I'm not going to go out of my way. But he does send some some fighters out there, and basically, every Obi Wan survives. Shocker, and everyone meets up in the landing zone, and they are able to overtake the droids and take the shield down. And, um, oh, at one point they flamethrower some of those Geonosians, and they all scream as they die, which was pretty intense and also out of Saving Private Ryan when they flamethrower the, the Germans in the, the bunker. So they get there, they land, they take down the generator, so they're going to be able to take over this factory. The droids immediately surrender once, or the bugs immediately surrender the Geonosians once they take down the field generator. And this brings us to what we were probably both alluding to, yeah. but Anakin and Ahsoka go over their kill count. And Ahsoka won for the first time ever. And Obi-Wan says a line, which I thought was going to set us up perfectly to be like, how can you guys do this in the middle of the battle? And before they can really respond, or if they do say a response, it's really dismissive, Kiati then mentions that he got more than both of them because he was keeping track, and then he asked what he won. And he got Anakin's respect, and that prize didn't seem worth it. And then they chuckle, and it fades to black. Yeah. And that could have been a really great place. I'm sure we were both thinking to be like, it's the only way we can cope with this crazy yeah, mess. that's what I have written here. Horrific and horrible. I said the the dialogue that I would have written is I can never understand how you two can turn these battles into some kind of game. And I wanted Anakin to say, Master, that's the only way we can make it to the next one. Yeah, I, and that I don't. I shocked me that they they couldn't set that up. So that that was disappointing. There there isn't much to make you think they wouldn't do that with how this episode is set up because this episode is very violent it is it is a straight battle from start to finish other than the 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 very opening and the very closing so what a a missed opportunity but i think i liked this episode a lot more than you because visually this is the best episode we've ever had the camera work they do is amazing it was documentary style i mean and, and they do some real crazy shots as well not just the documentary shaky cam when a bomb explodes and and things are happening but there's one point where i believe it's obi-wan waxer and boyle are talking and in one complete shot they they zoom in on obi-wan who's talking the two guys talk to him so it zooms back to show him and then when another one talks singularly they zoom to him all in one kind of continuous camera shot so it really really felt like a documentary and was just with them trying to capture everything kind of sporadically the sound is amazing and there's so much sound going on and so much things happening, but they have it's clear and it's crisp, but you can tell that they're they're focusing on multiple things, and there's also always multiple things happening in the frame. So Obi Wan and Wax are in Boyle maybe having a conversation, but there's people having a clear defined fight behind them, and it's not just generic blaster fire, it's a guy looking down trying to find his blaster, picking something up, hurling it over. It's more detailed. Like they put so much work into this episode 
that I ended up really enjoying it, even though there's the massive whiff at the end. Mm-hmm. Well, how many pews do you give it? I'll, I'll give it five. Five pews. For me, this ranks four of five this season. I did not enjoy this episode greatly. I think this episode is part of season two, which has been a much higher quality than season one. I would agree with you that the visuals are good. I did not like the palette. I did not like the return to Geonosis. Um, I did not like the return to a lot of things. We have uh, Anakin and Ahsoka acting like they always act, as if they haven't learned a single lesson in the entire uh, in the entire series thus far. We return to Geonosis, which I said is is a problem that I have. We have Obi Wan. Um, you know, we have no stakes. We know that Kiadi Mundi is not going to die. We know that that. Uh, Obi-Wan is not going to die and so that falls flat we have very little in the way of theme Uh, when you talk about the shield generator it's the same damn setup as the original I think it was the movie or or one of the first two episodes where they've got like the shield generator and they're trying to like sneak in and stuff like that it's it's there are it's everything we've already seen done at a higher quality and that's just not enough for me so I didn't enjoy it and the the huge miss at the end it probably resonates more with me because the opportunity to have such a hardcore theme would have made this probably my favorite episode. Um, but swinging and missing makes this a cartoon just for yuck yucks. If you hit that, it becomes more, it becomes important. It becomes something with ideas And this show like gets close to it, but never really hits it. And that's my major critique of the show so far. So I, I, the thought I had while watching this one is that this episode should have been the first episode of the entire series. Because right. as you point out, there's no character work here, and they're not attempting to do character work, and there there isn't much of the morality because they, they miss at the end. What this episode does really, really well is set a tone for what this war is, what it what the experience of being in this war is. So it would have been a great way to just kick everything off, but I can see how it feels hollow to you because we've been watching 27 episodes, 29 episodes or whatever of this. So to have an episode now where it's about this is what war feels like and this is what this experience is like if you're just a ground trooper running around, it, it feels too late to have done this. This this is, a to me, if you watch this episode, it's the only episode you watch. I think you would enjoy it and find a lot of good things about it in the context of where they set it. I get all your complaints. I think if this was the first episode of the entire series, everyone would be like, this is perfect. Because this now sets the tone for where we can go, and now we can do the character stuff and work on this, now that we get how harsh this world is going to be in this cartoon. So I I get that. So there we go. We That's the most we've ever disagreed on an episode. Yeah, because I think the other one we really disagreed on was... The there was the the there was a wacky one that was really stupid, but I just thought it was fun stupid. Yeah, probably. But this one I actually saw Merit in. So yeah, I thought you said Merit in like isn't there like a Disney princess or? Yeah, is that the Merida? one of Brave? I think yeah. or something like that. Sorry, yeah, sorry, I haven't seen that. Loop. Yeah, I do like Irish redheads. I was just gonna say that. Let's move on to other nerd news. And I'm a nerd. We have news for the beautiful people. <laughs> There's a lot more of us in our view. Luke, there's a wide, wide world out there. A world bigger than just Star Wars. What's going on in your world? So I've been really obsessed with this news story that I saw recently. And I don't know if you saw this, but it was this uh, killer whale, Orca, that its calf had died. And it was, it carried, then people were tracking it. It was carrying it in its mouth after it died. And it took, I think, almost three weeks before it finally kind of grieved and let it go and fall to the bottom and carry it around. So that, that was getting a lot of attention uh, of attention because it was kind of like, it's still holding it after this many days, it's still holding it. When will it let go? And then it, it did. And it made me think a lot about how this is nature summing up m- my fandom right now with the Chicago fire. Okay. I was like, please God, get to the <laughs> fire. Cause you said that you had something about the fire and I really don't like that sort of thing. And what I know about you, that news story would be horrifying to everything that you're about. Yeah, well, it's about. sad. It's yeah. sad because you're just seeing something that's grieving. And yeah. obviously that's the worst grieving. But I, and then I'm making light of it. But um, on, on to soccer, I don't even know where to start. Like, do you start on... You want to start on the field or off the field? I don't know. Um, because we have I've been out. I've been... Assu- I mean, for, for people to... Well, let's, let's do on the field okay. to start. Because I feel like we can get through that quicker. For, for, for the, the people at home, I have been out of the loop the last week. 
um, it's a week and a half of the Chicago Fire. I've been super busy at home and have and missed uh, the first game all here. I think is that I missed, and so um, things well, aren't looking good. The, the short version is is we haven't recorded a point since June thirtieth in MLS play, so we're almost if we don't win we're closing in on two months we're like a month and a half without even getting a point so it's the longest losing streak in franchise history we're last place in the east we're not making the playoffs by any shot unless we get help and win the remaining nine or ten games that we have i think it's nine left and so everything was focused on the open cup we were in the semifinals of that we rested <laughs> all our guys the game before in regular season play so that we excuse me have a full lineup in the open cup we got obliterated three to nothing by the Union, who are not a world-beating team. We would have hosted the final, so major opportunity lost. We signed no one in the window really. I mean, we traded for Raheem Edwards, who's looked pretty good, uh, works really hard, but he hasn't, guy, yeah. hasn't been able to finish. Hassler from Toronto, who we traded Vicaro, who was our number one draft pick that we traded up to get for Hassler, and Hassler so far has not looked very steady. And then uh, Del Greco. That that was we, the guy from was it Argentina? Argentina that we signed and now who we've now loaned out because he doesn't apparently doesn't look at the the center back. So we really got barely anything in the way of reinforcements. We only signed one guy in the the main winter window, which was Katai, and that's after getting rid of Vacam. Other than that, we just made kind of draft picks and and panic trades at the end of the year and signings like Alan Gordon. Can we can we take a just a quick pause? Yeah. And no, I don't mean pause the tape. I, I just want to point out um, when we talked before, everybody kind of crapped on me for saying that DC United was going to make a run. And I'm looking at the standings. They've been they've they're, been making a run. They're in second to last. No, they're not. Well, they're in eighth. Oh, I'm and I'm with, points per you, game. They're not making count, the playoffs. When you count games in hand, they have four games in hand over yeah, six place. Look at look at points per two. game. I'm just saying, dude. When you look at points teams, per game, they're not a playoff team, a and they're not... They're just on a run. They're on a run, and you guys laughed at me because you guys know everything. No, because you, sa- you said they're going to make... You were like, are they going to make the playoffs? Yeah. Is what you asked. And I will still so, laugh at you if you think they're going to make the playoffs. They're not that far. The impact are okay. good. The impact are not good. Okay. The refs are not good. Okay. I would be more than happy to wager whatever you'd like on DC making the playoffs. So think about that and let's get back to us. Right, get back, get right. back to us next right. week. So, let's get, so they're start. they're bad on the field. They yep. haven't won. There's no reason to think they're gonna win. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's not. I don't even know what we're really watching anymore. I mean, most of the young guys, the young guys don't really play, other than Bronico. So it's not you know like if they stuck Mo Adams in there, Lillard's hurt. Like there isn't young guys I'm really watching develop. So I'm I'm not really sure what I'm still gonna watch. But like, what are we watching? Yeah. The rest of the way, and then the off field stuff. Okay, just, so let's look, just real quick. It's as bad as advertised. Because I missed I missed one game, but it seems like the bottom has fallen out now. Yeah. Like, we were, like, making jokes about how, oh, we're a bad team. Like, we're... No, we're, if, it wasn't for, if it wasn't for Mark's Earthquakes, we would be by far the worst team in the league right now with the way we're going. I mean, there's just... You know, Nikolic certainly isn't the Nikolic we saw last year. Katai isn't the Katai we saw at the beginning of the year. And it looks like people are, you know, you, the only guy out there who's, the only two guys who seem like they're trying really hard are Schweinsteiger and Edwards. Um, most of the other guys seem like they're they're checked out or they're just not skilled. I mean, there is, you know, Brandon Vincent's playing the complete wrong position, so he looks awful. Kapilov's out there by himself, and he's going to make a mistake every now and again, and he's got no help. Campbell... I mean, we just let Ellis go. Who started like, in goal? In it's goal it's still Sanchez. I thought Cleveland or was that Cleveland played one game? game, which was the game before the Open Cup final, where they rested everyone, and they loaned him back down, I think. But he must be able to come back up because I don't know where our other goaltender would be because McLean is still hurt, and you know Sa- Sanchez Sanchez is still a young guy, but he can't start in this league if we want to go anywhere at this stage. The defense is the second worst defense in the league, so they don't help him at all. You know, I just, there's just nothing that's going right. There's nothing to be excited about at this stage from an on-the-field standpoint. And, you know, they've they've completely dissolved Sector Latino. They've tar- now tarped off the area where they're going to sit. And it looks like, I haven't gotten a season ticket holder renewal thing yet, but it looks like when you look at Twitter that they have sent them out to some people and they are officially selling Sector Latino seats as normal seats. So it looks like they're done. Like, they have no chance of coming back. 
and they are banning individual members that enter that section. So when we talked about the Toronto game, when I was really disappointed about how they ruined their protest by trying to storm the old section, they're going through and taking tape and identifying those people and giving them bans from entering the stadium at all. And the letters, people are putting the letters on Twitter. So it even says like the fire is like, we will prosecute you type thing, or, Whoa. you know, pursue type thing. So, so that's going really, really well and exciting for us. Whoa. I mean, we, you know, they banned section eight, for their participation in it for this upcoming game against the Red Bulls, but Section 8 has already declared that they're ceasing all support until things are rectified. Remember I asked you if this was going to be a way that they could just get rid of everything, and it's going to be... It's looking like it, too. And then, you know, there are other weird things where they started sending around invites to have a focus group about soccer in Chicago, and, you know people could fill out a questionnaire and accept and they got all these people that they they told could come and then it, this could be happening across the board because you're only getting this info off of twitter but a lot of the prominent members of section eight got accepted and then just recently they got letters saying oh we accidentally overbooked so you don't need to come but here's still your hundred dollars right which is a massive coincidence for some of these people that are getting booted because they're the people that are talking trash about the team the entire time on Twitter. And then you have Columbus fans who are like, yeah, this is what they did for us a year ago was have focus groups and, and all these things. So you have a lot of con conspiracy theorists out there about... Do you think they could move? No, I don't think. Because I don't know where they would move to because they're not going to abandon Chicago. No, and but that's... Dude, that's, that's the dream for a lot of people is that the... Uh... The Ricketts the, in their stadium. But they can't be an MLS until after 2030, regardless of whether the fire is here. Because the lease for Bridgeview doesn't say the fire. It says any MLS team. It's specifically designed to, to avoid this type of scenario where you would move the fire to another city and then install a new MLS team. So if Ricketts wants to be an MLS, he either has to play at Bridgeview or he has to wait till 2031 when the, the lease expires. Well, what I mean, so did did MLS sign that contract with Bridgeview then? Well, or did the fire? Because like the MLS can say we're not. I mean, I guess it's single it's, owner. It's entity, a single you know? entity, yeah. so no, it's it's binding to the. Yeah. I mean, you know, they could. I'm sure the league could pay it out if they wanted to do that. But if they wanted to do that, why wouldn't they just pay it out for the fire? Right. Um. So and and the other reason I don't believe that is is. A couple months ago, 49% of the ownership of the fire was bought to, and I can't remember the guy's name, but he's a local Chicago billionaire, yeah. the Morningstar guy, and he hasn't made any statements, which is a little odd or whatever, but I don't feel like that guy was going to get in and buy this much of the team right now so that it could move to Detroit or San Antonio or whatever, but... It's, it's real weird. I mean, the, the optimist in me wants to think, well, maybe this guy's buying 40, 49% now, and they have said, just let us run the team for the rest of the year when the season's over. After Because I think they thought they had a shot at things when he bought the team. They'll be like, hey, we're turning over the whole team to you, and, mm -hmm. then, and then he might take it. So that's what the optimist in me do you, is. Do you think he wants Sector Latino and sec Section 8 gone? No, I don't. I think that's completely Hotman and... and the people that he has filtered through him because remember this is a guy who when fans were protesting before and he had his director of communications write in edit the editorial the famous editorial about how terrible the fans are at at section eight and sector latino so and then they've talked before they tried to get they tried to tell them they had to sell a certain amount of tickets otherwise they were going to take their section away which sounds kind of reasonable to me to be honest right. on paper but um that didn't happen so i i feel like this has been it's it seems pretty clear to me that Hotman is pretty thin-skinned about how mean the fans are to him. And I, so I think he's the one that wants them out. So if I, my whole optimistic theory actually happens, the good thing would be, you know, this new guy takes over and they go back to the, the table to try to be like, hey, let's redo the code of conduct. Let's find a way we can all work together. Do you think, do you, okay, so you're a new guy. You come into the fire. Player or fan? No, the owner. Owner. Okay. Do you just fight? You just clean house and then get Peter Wilt back? Uh, I don't think you get Peter Wilt back necessarily. If you bring Peter Wilt back, I think you bring him back more as like a public relation, like fan relations type role, rather than the actual GM. He hasn't been an MLS GM in yeah, know, twelve but, years but or crap, whatever. Dude, but... you remember the Loons? The Loons just brought, brought 
all Minnesota soccer dudes. And ask their group. fans how happy they are with that right well, now. Okay, fair enough. Um, but yeah, you know, and I also think Peter Wilt seems to be the type of guy who likes to have like a two year project, one year mm-hmm. project, and then move on. But I, if you are going to have any relationship with Sector Latino and all those people, you'd have to get rid of Rodriguez. Um, that that bridge is burnt. And I I've been to a season ticket holder meeting the day before. It was either the day of or the day before he banned sect, Sector Latino. I went to a, a fan meeting because I did put my deposit down really early for next season. So they had a special event where we got to watch practice and he gave like a, a Q and A and people were asking him questions about that and about his bad choices with player signings this year. And he is, he's got all the marketing cliches down. Like it's straight out of a marketing textbook, the way he talks, but you could also talk about how, how little patience he had for a lot of those questions. And I knew from that meeting that sector Latino was done because some people asked him and he was just like, well, we're having another meeting with them and maybe they'll have some new evidence that proves they, they didn't do what they're saying they're doing. But, you know, I doubt it. Like, he said that to us before the meeting yeah. in this little So he group. had to be pretty sure. So he, he made it pretty clear he he yeah. didn't think much of them and they were going to have to do something miraculous. So he he would have to go, I think, for – they're. I don't think he has to go, go anyways. The, table. the team is god-awful. Yeah. He needs to get fired. Yeah. And I feel bad because I like Ponovich, but you know what? He needs to get fired too. He's, they don't need to worry about that because his contract's up at the end of the year. And and there's I don't no see... way that he wants to come back no, this mess. I don't think he wants to come back at all. Schweinsteiger's gone. And I and that sucks. The but only thing going. reason I think he might come back is because he seems to really love Chicago. Yeah, that'd that, be cool. That could be the the only saving grace. And whoever, you know, who who knows? Maybe you hire someone and let him have say in that or whatever. If you really want to appease him, but you also can't build your next version of the franchise around him. Right. So that can't be a consideration. But if you're gonna but, go with youth, and it'd be good to have him there and to sort of oversee the team, and you gotta have some salary. Yeah. You know. So. Well, it just sucks because. You know, if you believe the conspiracy theories, the the team is going to be in Detroit in two seasons anyway. But like the best case scenario, and I don't I don't believe that, but the best case scenario is we're starting another three year plan of not being terrible again. So it's you know now going. Do you remember on... how excited we were when we got Ponovich, and how it was finally going to be you know like something where we had this like you know world class manager and they were making all the right moves and we felt really confident like we just need to be patient and now it's well and i, I still like ponovich and all that stuff but i, I like do, but... yalp was such a, a nightmare at yeah. every level from just a competency standpoint like he just had the league had passed him by so much longer and maybe this is unfair but that kind of what jumped into my head when you said peter wilt is like mm. i don't want to go that yalp route no i'm not like, saying it's good was... i'm just saying like yeah that's a way to repair stuff you know like yeah you just Bring out any uh, any old name and then just try to you know like yeah men fences yeah I mean they I would I would think it would be a genius move to like, get him like what's Blanco doing now get him in some type what of, is Guatemala Blanco doing right now he is the mayor of a town in Mexico well, I mean so, is it well, a full time job but the Do other you think we could... the other valid point is is we have Clopas yep um but other than that like look at the former there are a lot of former fire players prominent fire players that are involved in teams they're just not involved in the fire mm. right so you have you know uh Boca's down in Atlanta doing their thing they had Logan Paws for a while but he quit and left to go to LAFC uh CJ Brown is in you know New York um Jesse Marsh just left for for Europe and he gets replaced by Chris Armas so there has to be a reason that former players don't seem to want to gravitate to doing stuff with our team. Like there should, you know, Josh Wolf is in Columbus. There are plenty of former prominent fire players that are still involved in MLS, but none of them want to be involved in the fire. And the other Twitter thing that was interesting is that obviously I don't expect any current player to say anything because it's their job and they, they yeah. can't. But Diego Gutierrez is, is a big fire legend who came out guns blazing on Twitter about, how current ownership is ruining everything and their disgrace and all that. So it was interesting to see because I feel like there's a lot of, if you pulled the fire players behind the scenes, the former fire players, they would all say what Diego Gutierrez is saying now. So it's, it's, I just, man, I, when I came into this team, I moved here in 2000, 2008. So I started cheering for the team in 2007 when I was knew I was moving here and it was like, when are we going to get past the Rebs to get into that the MLS Cup? And I sat in the stands when, in 2009 when we lost in penalty kicks to go to the to MLS Cup against RSL. And 
I remember. We went to a different country for this game. Well, granted, it was just Canada. Yeah, it was Canada, but, but still. it was still. We but, did. We traveled. I remember. I remember the humiliation and the the outrage that I felt, having only been involved for three, four years of what of the the year we didn't make the playoffs, mm. and being like, everyone should be fired. We didn't make the playoffs. This is so unacceptable. To being where we are now, where, you know, like being third to last seems like a decent season for us. Like that's. That's how terrible we've been since basically 2010. Here's a question I have for you. Mm -hmm. How do you fix it? Like, we've seen what Atlanta has done. I don't really think we have the money that Atlanta has. We've seen what LAFC has done and how they've built a team. Other teams that have had success uh, historically, like the Dynamo built a really good team for a long time a certain way by, by um, you know, getting those those sort of local stars like like um, De Rosario and um, and Donovan. Lo- like, <laughs> what? Well, De Rosario's from Canada. I mean local. But... I mean like North oh, American yeah, stars. Okay. You know, like yeah, I guess so. not like European Drafting stars. Guys and, right. Yeah. And so I mean, like, what is the way that this gets fixed? And I'm not. I mean, like, let's not even talk about the the damn MLS Cup. Like, let's just talk about a consistent winner. How do you do it in MLS? To I mean, you know the league much more than I do. Well, um, how do you do it? Uh, well, I mean, there's multiple roads to do it because if you look at the good teams, well, how do you do it? They do it. If how, you take over tomorrow. If, okay, um, it, the model, the safe, the safe model to follow is, I guess, what I would say is, it's actually Dallas is probably more, more what I want to take. I is, love Dallas. I love in, watching Dallas. Invest in your academy. Invest in your academy. Make that the cornerstone of what you're doing, and sign those players. Get a U.S. Start your own USL team. So that you can sign them to USL contracts, so they can get experience, and then when they're ready through the USL, you can either sell them, cut them loose, or sign them to the major team. So that you're developing a pipeline of talent that isn't dependent upon outside signings in the draft. Because I think if you're worried about or you're banking everything on hitting on the draft or European signings, you're where the fire are now. So they traded all this stuff to get these multiple draft picks, and they've already given up on Bacaro. Um, Adams has shown some promise, but he hasn't played in forever unless it's garbage minutes and you know guys like collier have been forced into roles and we haven't proven what they can do yet so if you're able to work and build a system that you're teaching them from when they're little kids to the usl team to the fire you're going to develop a better base of talent to draw from and then you can supplement that by going after big name european players going after whether it's going and getting the schweinsteigers of the world or trying to be more like atlanta and finding those younger south americans that will give you two to three great years that you then sell on to europe for more money that you can reinvest in your academy or other players and whatnot but i think for for me if i was in charge of the fire i would want to start with the academy like make the academy the cornerstone of everything that you have and that you want to do and what's disappointing about that is that the rumors circulating is that the fire are trying to basically outsource their academy because they they don't want to have one. They would rather just license their name to existing soccer clubs because MLS requires you to have an academy, and that would kind of be their loophole among actually doing anything with it. So if that's wasn't actually that, true... Wasn't that what used to be the pride of the team? Yeah. When I first started, they, they all talked yeah. about the, the academy. And... Yeah. Yep. But that's... That's, that's a long time Days passed, that. along yeah. with our... Yeah, you know, that's... Who, who do you bring in to manage? Uh, I honestly, I... I don't know right now um i'm not sure who's out there i you know like the the big names that are out there are caleb porter which i think he's going to cincinnati wait wasn't he he resigned from the timbers to take time off but he's he's from akron he was the coach at akron that's where they hired him from i'm guessing he's going to cincinnati they just traded for fernando adi who he he coached for a long time in portland so i don't think he would come to us and he's also like he won mls cup but it was kind of like a good run type thing rather than they're a dominant force. Mm-hmm. So I'm not really sold on him completely. And then Christ is the other big name that's out there. And I think the way the fire are currently modeled, Christ is a little bit better than them, because better fit for him because they'll have patience to let him have two or three years where Orlando and New York are like, make us good right away. Right. And he couldn't do that, which RSL did, but he still failed at two places now rather, rather famously. Um, 
And then other than that, I mean, you know, the, the some of the names that get batted around are like, you know, Robin Frazier has been an assistant everywhere that everyone has. He's always that he's that guy that always is in the final two and never, you know, what Lovey Smith used to be. I like I like that guy. I yeah. like that guy in all sports, and I like that guy in MLS because what we've learned is that MLS is so tricky for newcomers. New managers have a tough time adapting to everything generally. At least that's the way it I, was. I think that's an is old that, attitude. That, I don't okay. think that fits the, the modern one. Um, I, I and you know because we say like Pereja did fine, and you know like Ponovich had his ups and downs. I don't think most people blame him for the problems they had. Vieira stepped in and was immediately better than Christ, who was seen as the, the model MLS guy. Um, and, uh, so, so we do, we do see it happen, but you know, at, at some point you can't just buy something just because he coached somewhere else. So if like guys like Robin Frazier, everyone likes and everyone supports and they have plans when they come in and interview about what they would do, like why, why wouldn't you take a shot on that guy? Because, Bob Bradley's not coming back. He's he's pretty set right. where he it's is. A pretty and good I, club. I'm not. I don't. I don't need Bruce Arena. So, you know, it's hurtful hmm. as a former Galaxy fan, like as somebody who traveled to halfway across the country for Galaxy games. The Galaxy are turning into the Los Angeles Rams, where LAFC is like the Los Angeles Raiders, and that really kind of burns me up a little bit. You got the suburban team versus like. I'm starting to think LAFC is like the real LA team. What do you like? What do you think about that whole dynamic? You know better than I do, but just from my scene and just watching the crowds, I think well, it's there's a lot of differences, right? Yeah, it's easier to get to LAFC from from what we hear. It's a downtown stadium. It's cool and it's new yeah. as well, and they're significantly better. The Galaxy have been bad for a few years now, and now they're starting to look a lot better. They're making a they're actually the ones making a run. Yeah. If you want to talk about someone making a run right now. Um, but it, it's more convenient to, to go to that, the LAFC stadium, plus their, their merch is cooler. Um, and, and they did that purposefully. Like I remember listening to some of their marketing guys talk about how we wanted something that looked like an MLB baseball hat that people would want to wear everywhere. Even if they didn't know what it was, they would just see and go, that baseball hat is cool. So I'm going to wear it. Mm -hmm. And that was the mindset they had when they made their logo versus trying to make a, uh, a soccer crest and the the black se. is the black is no coincidence and yeah is the... yeah yeah so they they were very strategic in how they did it i think it's too early to tell like lafc is uh the hot thing right now because it's new and it's fun and it's exciting let's wait and see when they're both bad or they're both good which way those goes because you know when it's all said and done Right now, there's one team with five stars above its crest, and there's one with none. Right. So we'll, we'll see where people truly end up. I mean, but as a casual fan of those teams, if I was going to go to L.A., my priority would be to see LAFC because that looks like a lot more fun experience in a cooler stadium than going to Home Depot Center right now or StubHub Center or whatever they call it. Same question, but now New York. So those teams are both good right now. They're, they're both good. Um, What's and, the real New York team? Whew. So I think I, I I think you would get that NYFC is probably the more popular team across the city, but the 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 oh man I don't even know what the right phrase is because I don't want to say real fans because I hate I hate it when yeah. people do that. But like the obviously the long term devoted people are more at Red Bull. Mm -hmm. um, and again, that's a weird geography thing as well, because Harrison is definitely not the Bronx, so it's easier for people to get to NYFC. They're both good and exciting teams to watch, though I've, I've been there, but watching games in, on Yankee, in Yankee Stadium on TV is horrific to me with how small that field is. Like, it's embarrassing. Better than Giant Stadium when we went to that one? That was like the worst sporting event I've ever been to. Yeah, that was bad. That so that was two thousand seven. We went to Giant Stadium on Mother's Day, and it was it was ninety plus degrees, and the Mets were home and the Yankees were away, and there was maybe seven thousand people in Giant Stadium. I think the announced attendance was like nine thousand, and if there were six to seven, I would say at best. So it looked like you were playing in front of it. It looked like those games where they they ban the fans from coming in. That you can it see on so on TV. Oh my so no, God. I'd rather go to a stadium that has people, but just from a, a field perspective. And it's a shame to me that Red Bull can't fill up because fill up because I think 
Red Bull is the coolest looking soccer stadium in the U.S. to me, Red Bull Arena. Like, I think it just looks amazing and badass, but when you watch their games on TV, it's half empty. So that takes the fun away. So when I'm not watching the fire, I gravitate towards teams like um, Kansas City that have really cool looking soccer stadiums that are full and rowdy and whatnot. So if they could ever get that in the Red Bulls, I think that would be probably the best of both worlds. And I, I don't know how much the location plays into it, but I mean, there's... 20 million plus people in that metro area like why can't you fill two fucking soccer stadiums yeah. <laughs> it shouldn't be that hard i mean there's, there's 10 million in chicago why can't we get twenty thousand people there well, it's so hard now yeah it's so hard yep really well so you hard. know what put a freaking team on the field yeah yeah that's one way to do it well this is the way we did it this time around luke Nitzel, where can the uh the people find you at Luke underscore Neitzel, N-E-I-T-Z-E-L. And I'm at Maya Madrid. Together, we are two-thirds of at Kid Seriously. And we will see you later. Bye. Thanks for listening to Kid Seriously. If you didn't completely hate us, feel free to hit like, subscribe, or tell a friend about the show. If you want to write to us and tell us how much we suck, or just ask a question, you can reach us at kidsseriouslyradio at gmail.com. Otherwise, hit us up on Twitter, at kidsseriously. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.